and welcome to the latest USPHS Women's Leadership Support Group podcast. I am your host, Lieutenant Commander Jessica Krieger. Today we have four wonderful officers with us here at the USPHS Scientific and Training Symposium in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And today we'll be talking about some of their experiences uh, and advice regarding deployments. So up first, uh, we have Lieutenant Commander Erin Grasso. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Science from Rutgers University in Public Health and Spanish, as well as a Master of Public Health in Behavioral Sciences and Health Education from Emory University. She is a Certified Health Education Specialist, as well as a Certified Emergency Manager with the State of Georgia. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Grasso is a member of RDF3 and has the, had the opportunity to train and deploy with her team for multiple events and has deployed outside of her RDF team with the Monrovia Medical Unit Team 4 in Liberia for the Ebola response as the Deputy Admin Section Chief with Koki 2B for Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. She is married and has two sons named Luca and Jack. Mm -hmm. Hi, Erin. Thank you for coming today. Hello. Thanks for having me. We're very happy to have you. I'm very happy to be here. All right. Up next, we have Lieutenant Krista Ferry. She's an environmental health officer with the Food and Drug Administration. Lieutenant Ferry works as a compliance officer with the Division of Southeast Imports, where the duty and the duty station is in Cincinnati, Ohio, but she lives in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Lieutenant Ferry was commissioned in 2011 after graduating with an environmental health science degree from Eastern Kentucky University. She's currently pursuing her master's degree from the University of New England. She's married to a fellow uh, PHS officer uh, who commissioned in 2015, and together they have two children, one boy, uh, aged five, Cooper, and one little girl, Layla, who's almost two. Hello, Krista. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me. Up next, we have Commander Jennifer Borman. Commander Borman joined the CDC in December of 2016. She focuses her efforts on the well-being and resiliency of CDC employees as part of the Occupational Health Clinic within the Office of Safety, Security, and Asset Management. As the agency's resiliency coordinator, she provides leadership and support through the conceptualization, development, and execution of programs and communication strategies throughout the CDC. Commander Borman is a member of the Services Access Team, or SAT-3, and has deployed numerous times, including the Camp Fire Wildfire in Paradise, California, Hurricane Recovery in St. Croix, and the Ebola epidemic in Liberia, as well as quite a few others that I'm just not gonna get into right now because the list is very long. Uh, Commander Borman received her MS from Columbia's University School of Social Work and her BA from the University of Maryland. She's a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Maryland and is a three-time Ironman finisher. Welcome, Commander Borman. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming. And last but certainly not least, we have Commander Carrie Sarisa, who is a pharmacist at the FDA. Uh, Commander Sarisa began her career with the Public Health Service in 2003 as part of the Senior Co-Step, and upon graduation from pharmacy school in 2004, she began her first duty assignment with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. She gen then joined the Food and Drug Administration in 2008. In her current role, she conducts scientific reviews related to pregnancy and lactation as a clinical analyst in the Division of Pediatric and Maternal Health. She earned a Bachelor's of Science in Biology from the University of Maryland, a Doctorate of Pharmacy from Shenandoah University, and a Master of Public Health from the University of North Carolina. Welcome, Commander Sarisa. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. And I'm just going to put in a little disclaimer here uh, that any views, ideas, opinions, or thoughts presented here today are of the individual officer and do not represent those of the U.S. Public Health Service or their associated agency, which the officer is employed at. So today we just kind of want to talk about... Uh, your deployment history, what you've done, where you've been, any advice you might have, and we'll just go from there and just kind of have a conversation. So the first one we'll start off and we can go in any order, so hop in wherever you want. Um, tell me if you're on a tier one or a tier two team, tier three team. Uh, if so, what made you decide to join it and how long have you been on the team? Um, I'm on RDF three, which is a tier one deployment team, rapid deployment force three. And I've been a member of the plan section there since 2010. I joined about six months after commissioning. Was there anything specific know. that like led you to join? Did you I know got people recruited. Were team, you got, I got recruited hard. Fancy. I am fancy. I think there's a lot of us who are at CDC or in Atlanta, at least at that point. And you know, 
it's a small world of public health. You get to know people very quickly or you get to know their names very quickly. Mm -hmm. So I get recruited and I never left. It's my family of PHS. That's where you get to really know people is when you deploy and you see them without their anything happy. <laughs> without them. their armor on, their emotional armor. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a wonderful experience for the Swiley Commission. That's why I stay. It's my favorite. I like it. Yeah. In case her leadership is listening, I hope you all heard that. Hi, Captain Henry. <laughs> uh, Hi, I'm... Captain Rice. Uh, is anybody else on a tier one, tier two, tier three yeah. team? Yeah. I am also on the same team as Erin, um, Rapid Deployment Force 3, and I'm the pharmacy branch director. Um, that is a new role. I was the deputy pharmacy branch director okay. for this. I joined the team in 2011, I think. Um, and I've done maybe a half dozen deployments, uh, some with RDF3, some with other teams. Um, we're in Florence most recently, too, right? Yeah, most recently, just last September, for mm -hmm. Hurricane Florence, we were okay. in North Carolina. And then I've done you know, a number of other. But deployments are actually probably the main draw that I had to joining the Corps. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything would be so intangible and theoretical without being on a deployment team. We're lucky, I think, because our team really does go up very often. We do, and we, like you said, we have become a family. And um, I got recruited also on the team um, by some. I when I started the, my career with um, the BOP, I was at FCC Butner, and a large mm -hmm. number of folks mm -hmm. are on um, RDF three, and that's how I got recruited. Mm -hmm. So it's also we've become a family, but it's also sort of a reunion because then I get to go back and see all those folks I worked with for all those years that mm -hmm. was with BOP. So it's very nice to work with them again. I like it. It's great that you mentioned family because I'm on SAT three, and um, you know we've been trying to go out more with our you know brother and sister RDFs. We would really really like SATs to come out with us. Yeah, a lot. And we work very well with your team, and I know your your previous team commander uh, often requested us, and um, I always loved working with uh, my RDF3 colleagues, and, and we became part of part of the family as well at times, and um, it's, so SAT is a tier two team, mm -hmm. and I joined, similar to Aaron, like six months after I commissioned, so I think it was November 2010, when I joined SAT3, and I'm currently the safety officer, and it's just such an amazing group of people who I, I love to work hard with, and mm -hmm. um, I will do anything for them. I'll run into any burning building and do what's ever needed, and we very much function as, as a team. You know, if someone's having a tough day, we'll take up, you know, some of their stuff, and, it's, you know, we just very much work together, and I was drawn to the team. Um, I, I think I was recruited too. I, it's a little blurry. It was so long ago. But uh, I had an interview with um, our then team commander, uh, then commander Chris McGee, and and he's like, you know, we need the right people for this team. We we have a reputation, and you know, we we work really hard and we really work on partnering with everyone because that's what SAT has to do in the field and and SAT's role is very I mean those of you who have deployed with us it's it's a very sort of amorphous role it's really developed over the years and, mm -hmm. um, and he's like we work hard but but we play hard we you know enjoy each other's company and, and we want um, our deployment experiences and all of our interactions to be as rich um, as possible and uh, he has followed through with that promise, and um, it's it's really been an honor. Similar to you, I'm actually a legacy. My father was in the Corps, and um, so I grew up in the Corps, which is weird for some folks to think about. Um, awesome. My dad's a retired admiral, and um, but I, mm -hmm. what keeps me in it is absolutely the deploying. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Agreed. So I'm also on a, a rapid deployment team. I'm on RDF five. What? Yeah, and I joined in 2015. 
whenever I, I, I wasn't recruited, so I'm a little bit different than you guys. I, I had a supervisor for the first couple of years that I was in the co the core that didn't want me to do anything. So as soon as I got another supervisor and I hadn't deployed yet, I was like, okay, first thing I'm going to do is start sending out emails to all these RDFs. And RDF 5 took me. They, <laughs> <laughs> they, they accepted me because I was like, please, I'm here. Take me, you know? That's so important, though, to like be yeah. enthusiastic. Yeah, I was like, I really yeah. want to be on a team. Please mm-hmm. pick me. Take me. I'll do whatever. So I'm uh, on RDF 5, the environmental health unit. Um, I have actually not deployed with RDF 5, but I did deploy uh, for the unaccompanied minors mission, you know? And I, I will say that um, it was life changing. It mm-hmm. really was. Um, and the people that I met there, some of the bit relationships that I built, I'm looking at you, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Um, they're second to none. I'm actually really happy that you brought up that you weren't recruited. I was I'm happy we yeah. have the kind of the, the different ways right. here because I feel like there's this not true conception in PHS a lot of times that it's only who you know. Right. I think who you know is a part of it, and I think networking is important, and coming to the symposium is important, and deploying is important for separate reasons, but also for networking reasons. And so it's good to hear of people who are able to get on a team just by putting them out themselves out there. Right. I think it's an important fact that people overlook sometimes because cool. they're like, well, I don't know anybody, and I, I, get I work know in anybody. the field. And I so do. I work such a in great the field. Example. I'm, I've been around my entire career. The, the most amount of officers that I've ever been around in an office is four, including myself. Mm-hmm. Okay? So my first duty station was Louisville, Kentucky. There were two other officers. I moved to Memphis, Tennessee, one other officer, which was my husband. Okay. (laughs) Was he your husband after or before? No, at the time, at the time. Yeah. And then now there's three other officers, four, including myself. So I wasn't recruited. Nobody knew me to recruit me. So I had to go just sending emails to people that didn't know who I was and like, please let me join your team. I want to deploy. This is why I joined the Commission Corps, so I could deploy and feel like I make a difference, you know, but... Um. I'm glad you brought that up because I precept pharmacy students, and the biggest point that I always try to push is that um, how important networking is and how they just have to ask. Like, it doesn't hurt to ask, but you have to put yourself out there because mm-hmm. I feel like I've gotten to where I am today by just asking and pushing. Right. And I um, I applied to the COSTEP program, mm-hmm. and I got on the wrong list. And I got a phone call from FDA from from an officer oh, okay. that said, I understand you're a pharmacist and you're looking for a job. And I said, no, I'm a pharmacy student, um, but do you take students? And she said, well, no. And I said, but if you would consider me, <laughs> I will work really hard for you and you will not be um, disappointed that you took me on as a student. And she said, well... All right, we'll see. All right, I'll, I'll bring you on. So she did. That's amazing. I had a wonderful experience. I kept in touch with her. I did my time at BOP, and I called her, and I said, hey, I want to come back to Maryland. That's where I grew up. I want to move home, and I want, I love my experience at FDA, and that's what I, what I ultimately want to do. Um, can you help me out? And she said, yes, send me your CV. And I had an interview like a week later. That's incredible. That's so awesome. I don't know. I think it's just networking is really important, and it doesn't – you really got to put yourself out there or. Well, and on the flip side, I think um, we need to have our eyes out for junior officers who um, have a lot of interest and desire to serve. And we need to be there to foster that because I think that's one thing that we all as a core need to do better. And that's really supporting each other. Um, in in their careers and and I think deployment teams are a way to do it so if you meet some amazing JG or or LT and they have a lot of energy and they have the interest that's our duty to help develop them and help them network and find a team that makes sense for them Um, I know whenever I bring someone to our team you know they have to have the energy and the desire and and the willingness to put up with with our unique personalities. But um, I just brought in a new LT on our team and that's one of the most fulfilling things. It's not something you put on your CV. It's not something that anyone else notices, but it makes an impact on the life of that LT and it enriches your team. 
and it enriches hopefully your career without it having to be a benchmark or anything like that. And I think the more and more we do that and help each other, the stronger um, core we will be. I think that's something that you, you brought up something really important because you said, you know, we, ha we have to reach out to these young, younger officers, but part of the commission core is serving vulnerable po populations, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So I'm in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and, and we have to remember that whenever we're serving vulnerable populations, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be around Atlanta and D.C. and, and in headquarters. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you're sending a new officer out to a vulnerable population, they may not be around mm -hmm. other officers that can help them or recruit them to get on these teams. So I think that networking is so important and reaching out to those people and then also giving them the confidence to reach out because... I didn't. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know who to contact when I was sending out emails, being like, "Please mm -hmm. pick me." Like, mm -hmm. let, let me. Let, I know you don't have an opening, and there's been no announcement that says RDF five needs a, a person. But um, I'm your girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Right. You know? So, but we. That's that's on us. Right. Right. That is truly on on us that we need to be developing each other right. and supporting each other again. Not for CV purposes, for human existence purposes. Well, and Amen. public health. Yeah. Public health. Public I mean, health. it's the nature of our service. One is to be, oh, in the field of public health, is to be interdisciplinary and collaborative. So I think we have that to begin with. But one of the wonderful ways that we are different from our other services is that we're leading our careers. So I think we all have that, at least I hope, a little bit in us. We all have a little bit of ambition. We all you know, our hearts are all in the right place. And I like the way you say how, well, at least to begin with, I'll mm -hmm. say that. <laughs> Getting some faces. I think that's the truth. I mean, I think that people are coming in with the intent to do well, but to do good. And to do good for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a lot of different capacities. Um, so... How would you want the court to do that, or individuals just looking out for somebody who, you know, looks like a little shy puppy? Or would you do you like seeing them more formalized, like no, method? Not formalized whatsoever. I know you're formalized is a checkbox. <laughs> yeah. That's you know, no. Yeah. It's just being good people. It's being good people. It's it's. Hey, do you need something? Hey. You know, can I help you with that? Or, um, hey, I've actually, you know, I've been very lucky in my career mm -hmm. to have been able to deploy um, for my agency through kind of a, a through a DOD thing, through um, and through, of course, through Red Dog. And I feel like it is such a privilege to do that. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm out there on on those deployments, I just simply try to bring people with me. Often, even officers senior to me have never been out the door. And so it's about engaging with them and, you know, letting them know how a JFO functions or, you know, and it's not about telling people how it works. It's about showing them and engaging them with whatever projects, projects you happen to be working on and um, truly sharing that respect. And I, I just think it, it's got to come fairly naturally. And yes, for some people, that's more natural than others, Aaron. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with you. But I think if you're going to climb the ranks in, in officership, you need to do this. So even if it's not comfortable for you, you need to learn how to do it. Otherwise, why are you a higher rank? Because as higher rank demonstrates leadership and developing younger and newer officers is the most important thing uh, we need to do as senior officers, period, and stop. So it's something that we all need to work on. Did I answer that? I did. I just wanted to hear you speak. <laughs> <laughs> I like the thought of it not being a formalized process, of it not being a checkbox, of it not being something that you have to do to be a cookie, because to get a cookie my own personal hope and goal for the core for one day is to just be this group of badass officers who do badass things just to be badasses, not to get the award, not to get the promotion, 
And I, I like that's my my hope for us as a whole to one day be seen as that. Like these are people who are not stepping on people. They're not climbing over each other. They're not climbing the ladder. They're just doing amazing things to be amazing and bringing and people with us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, Jess. All right, let's start. So I like that you all have been talking about deployment as this enriching, wonderful experience. And for most of you, myself included, mainly the sole reason I joined the core. Um, and I know a lot of people have not had the opportunity to go out the door. So if you'd like to, I'd like you all to tell me maybe something about either your most touching, most enriching, most life altering, ex either experience on deployment or deployment as a whole. Um, and we'll just kind of go from there. I was very privileged to be a part of Monrovia Mental Clean Unit Team 2, MMU2. And um, for those who may not know, we are the only U.S. federal entity that treated people with Ebola. Um, and that was over in Liberia. And I happened to be there during Christmas and New Year's. And some of us got to go to an orphanage uh, on Christmas Day. And it was during our work day, so um, we went to the orphanage and then had to come back and, and go back to work. But um, we really wanted to do that. It was, yeah, it was, um, it was amazing. So it was an Ebola orphanage. So it was, oh my um, gosh. it was young people who had lost a parent or both parents to Ebola. And mind you, I had only been there like two weeks at Christmas and it was sort of like, well, if their parents had Ebola, how <laughs> close are we, you know, it, and yeah. these are kids, they're all over you. Right. And, and you want to, you know, you don't want to stop that. You know, they're, these are kids looking for love, you know, and, and acceptance. And so luckily our, our night shift team who, who was amazing, our night shift, uh, prepared gifts for all the kids. And so we brought gifts and, and including soccer balls, which disappear immediately. Um, <laughs> and then we were able to do, um, you know, play games with the kids. We, we taught some of the, uh, heads of household, um, you know, hand washing techniques and stuff like that. And it, it was very powerful, but there was this one kid who, um, he was so cute and he would wink very <laughs> flirtatiously, right? He would wink. And I'm winking. Um, um, and his name was Emmanuel. And um, he was just adorable. And he would just find me and just stand with his buddies and wink. <laughs> and throughout the morning, you know, it was, it was so cute. And, you know, I got a couple pictures with him. And, you know, he got a gift and everything. And I never really got his story. You know, he was with his buddies. I wasn't going to embarrass him and make him tell, you know talk to the adult and all that stuff, but, um, he was just such a great kid. And, and for some reason he just shadowed me and we go to leave and we finally got out of this ditch. Our bus was stuck in and, um, I had to say bye and I wait, you know, bye, bye Manuel. I hope to see you soon because we were there for a while longer. And so I was hoping to be back and he just waved and waved and, and then I, I was behavioral health, so I checked in with everyone on the bus, like, how's everyone doing? Wow, that was, this was the most intense Christmas I've ever had. This was amazing. Um, and just checking in with folks, and a buddy of mine tapped me and said, hey, Borman, um, your buddy is is out there. And so he followed the bus mm -hmm. and kept waving. And I'm, so I waved, hey, man. And then he kept following the bus, and it was it was so it was so moving to me. I'll never forget. It. I mean, I'm I'm picturing him right now running alongside and and then, you know, when the bus finally got to the place where it could pick up speed, you know, I said, "Okay, man, we'll go back. I'll see you soon." And he nodded and and waved and I saw him turn around and start to walk back. And sadly, that was the last time I ever saw him. Anymore. And uh, I did go back to the orphanage and I asked for him and they kept presenting me with young boys named Emmanuel. And I'm like, no, that's not him. So I don't know where he is. Um, I sure, sure hope he's okay and that he's loved and somewhere safe. But that to me changed Christmas forever. And uh, that young man will always hold a very strong place in my heart. 
Got me all teared up over here, oh, lady. Sorry, incredible story. Oh. Not that that's all. You know, easy story to follow. I was going to say, I'm not following. You don't have to. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. I don't, I, don't I, to. Top that. I don't think I have a most memorable deployment. I think they've all carried different. <clears throat> I think I've taken away something different from all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know that one stands out more than the other. Mm -hmm. Did you have anything that was a large takeaway from any of them? It doesn't have to be in the same context. Oh, no. Um, no, I just think I've learned from each one to expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. Everyone's been so different in every aspect. So flexibility and Semper same thing goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've only been on one deployment, and it was um, the unaccompanied minors mission. And uh, it was extremely extremely emotional I don't, mm -hmm. I don't even know how much i'm allowed to say about this but i i, I am um, a mom of two you know so for me hearing these stories from these parents was heart-wrenching and one story that i'll never forget is that this woman we were talking to her and she was telling us that she wanted to seek asylum in the united states because ms-13 was recruiting her son and she didn't want them to get her son, so they held a gun to her head and made her eat a frog in front of her son as a threat. And she literally just had a panic attack on me. We weren't supposed to touch these people, you know, or be in any kind of contact. But I can remember whenever she started crying and weeping, I just, I grabbed her hand. I did. I couldn't help it. I was like, she needs some type of human contact, you know, like, I'm sorry, you know, and she, um, she weeped and as a fellow human, I weeped with her and that experience for me, it was life changing. I still think about her story all the time, all the time. I still think about her and think like, oh my gosh, you know, the only difference between she and I is where we were born. That is literally the only difference. Mm -hmm. because we're both moms that want the best for our children, mm -hmm. that would do anything for our children, and she just happened to be dealt, excuse my language, a really shitty card because of the place that she was born. So, uh, we didn't speak the same language, but on that day, whenever I grabbed her hand, we did. We spoke the same language. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that doing that deployment and that moment, it was so much more than just filling out the paperwork, mm -hmm. going through the motions. It was actually making another human feel like you saw them, you heard them, and you were doing your best to help them. So um, that deployment was, it was really emotionally challenging for me. And uh, one of the things that I realized really soon into that deployment and hearing all those stories is I'm going to have to find a buddy. That I can talk to. Mm -hmm. And I found that in Jess. Hi. I did. I found yeah, that in Jess. Nice. You know, I mean, there were times that we would have to just step outside and, and we needed a good cross session. And, a hug. and that was all right. And a hug. You yeah. know, and yeah. that was all right. And that's what we did. But um, yeah, that, that for me is the only experience that I have. And that's the only thing that I can bring to the table as far as, you know, what I've done as far as my deployments. But um, remembering that we're all just. We're, we're all the same. We really are. Mm -hmm. And we all just want to do what's right and what's good. So, I mean, that's, that's was my takeaway from deployment as far as, you know, that goes. Be a good human. <laughs> it's it's that simple, folks. And I think that might be the core's new motto. Yeah. That's what it should be. Be a good human. And the battle buddy concept. Oh I'm so gosh. glad you mentioned it's so that. It's so important. Because it's I, critical. It is. It is absolutely critical. And it's not a relationship that stops. Mm-mm. Uh -uh. Once your deployment is done, it's not again a check in the box and no, nope. at sisters all. Are brothers afterwards. They no, really they are, are your family. family. They are family. It, it is hard true. to come back. I think yeah. it's hard to come back. Mm -hmm. and at first, I had a really hard time admitting that because I thought we were only gone two, three weeks. I shouldn't be having a difficult time adjusting back to my family, but. Every time. It's mm -hmm. hard to come back. It is. Well, it you, takes time. You I love those people. You literally just you fall in love with these people that you deploy with that you've just met. You do. You spend 24 hours a day mm -hmm. with them, and then all of a sudden you're not with them, and you have to go home, and you have to make lunches and go to soccer. And, and nothing. You, 
I came back from being in Puerto Rico for a month and I walked in the house and I went upstairs and I just, I broke down. I didn't know what to do. I yeah. thought, what am I supposed to do? What time is it of the day? I don't know where I'm supposed to be or what I'm supposed to do or how I'm supposed to go. And why is it the kids at school? And why? Yeah. I, yeah, exactly. But what's the big deal if I don't do this? Is there a a bigger purpose? Yeah, Yeah. yes. I remember to that point, so our first day in orientation in grad school, and our dean, this Dean Kern, Admiral uh, James Kern, Jim Kern, and he said, you know, wonderful advice and stories about his AIDS triumphs in the early 80s. He said, when you come to this school and you enter this field of public health, you're going to meet your soulmates. It might not be your husband. It might not be your wife. It might not be, you know, something like that, but you're going to meet your soulmates. You are going to meet your, the people that bring light to you. I believe and that, that 100%. You, absolutely. Come and on. it's the same thing here. I mean, we're a special kind of crazy nerds that join <laughs> the core. I mean, it's, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter how good it's looking. A we are, because we yeah. are, Nerds and are beautiful, lovable. and Nerds are very lovable. seriously, right. we have great conversations, right. right? But, like, it takes a special type of nerd to not only want to gain this type of knowledge, but apply it in a very real, very impactful way on an individual level, yes, but on a population-based mm-hmm. level. And I think when you're deploying, that's amplified. You're taking, you know, a hyper-focused group of people who are just like you, at least in a very fundamental way, which is I'm here, yes, of course, to serve my country, but I'm here to do good on behalf of my country and to help in any way that I can. Um, Yeah, and it's stressful, but... These relationships that we take away from our deployments, though, are so crucial in recovering afterwards as Mm -hmm. far as emotionally and mentally because had I not had some of these friends or family, not not friends, family, Mm -hmm. family that I had made to be able to just talk with and things like that, it's so important. Um, And I think that that's one of the best things about deployment is that you meet these wonderful officers and had you not deployed with them, you maybe would have never had that opportunity to spend so much time mm-hmm. for them to become not just a co-worker or another fellow officer, but to actually become family to you and somebody that you want to speak to regularly and, you know, you're excited to see and yeah. things like that. Uh, so that, that's, for me, one of the best things about deploying is the relationships that you get to build in those times. And I think that's also a really important reason, for me at least, like my, I don't want to say a pilgrimage, but I make sure that I come to the symposium. Since commissioning, I only list, I missed one because I was about 50 months pregnant and it was in Arizona. <laughs> yes, I had a small solar system that was orbiting around me and I did not want to be far away from my husband at that point. And I think it was a reasonable decision. Um, you know, it kind of broke my streak. But every year... I come to the symposium. It's just, you know, I remind my supervisor, my husband knows, um, like, it's just going to happen. I have to come back here because I need to be around good officers and good people. And it's, I don't want to say, cathartic. it's kind of like summer camp. For, it, I, it almost, it, it almost is, but it's just being around good people and enjoying it it's and like remembering why again. you're doing this. I don't this. know if that makes sense. But it's yeah. like coming home again every year when I come to the symposium. I, I feel like it's just wonderful to reconnect with them. It is. Yeah. And it, it, it's good for your soul. It just yeah. is. Right? Take time away from the busy schedule to yeah. realize that you're with people that mean a lot in your life. You know, they do. They're yeah. important to us. Mm-hmm. Share the same mission. Yeah, they do. And Protecting and promoting public yeah. health. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. And we, it, and it's really important. Um, I'm so glad you all mentioned. I'm, I'm the behavioral health person in the room, and I work in the resilience program at CDC. So thank you all for mentioning just how important these relationships are, and counting on these relationships, and, and. Um, I don't want to say using these folks, but like developing these relationships as a protective factor because it, it allows you to do better work in the field because we do, we go all out, all out. And we go home 
all of a sudden it gets quiet, right? It does. You're expected to jump right back into life, and it's right. hard to figure out where to start. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, what steps to take. <laughs> it's, it's an adjustment, and mm-hmm. I still think, you know, no matter how many days you're out, I think it's an adjustment. Yeah. Oh, it does. And and I say that all the time. I mean, I've gone on two week deployments that were so intense. And, you know, of course, the longest one, our our Liberia one, uh, that was so intense. (laughs) So uh, but it's any interruption to your life. And and we completely shift our missions. I mean, think about that, Um, especially for those who have not deployed. when you go out, I mean, you have a whole new mission. Like your yes. work email, none of that matters. It is you are solely focused on the mission at hand, and you're focused as a team, which is 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 such an important dynamic that many of us don't get in our day jobs. Right. And so, if you happen to be a new officer or haven't deployed, and you go out on a deployment, you're going all in. And that's something definitely to be aware of. Don't tell your boss, oh, I'll get back to your email no. later in the day. No. If you are <laughs> deployed, it's a it's they're no longer a, your boss. A you focus. fall under the secretary. Goodbye. Yep, it's a it's a focused mission and you'll do great work. Can uh, I say something on the other side of that coin? Because I think, <laughs> at least for me, so sometimes I find it to be stressful when you go out and you know that there's something bad that's happening, and you know that there needs to be people with your skill sets or your team skill sets, and you want to go out and you want to do these great things, and you can't, and how hard that is, too, Mm -hmm. because you're not doing what you want to happen, because you're not allowed to, or you can't, or there's some other type of bureaucratic issue or political issue or, yeah, Um, and you can't, and that's stressful, too. Not being able to do what you know is yeah. right, that is really stressful. Count on your battle buddies. Yes. And that, those are, Aaron, you're exactly yeah. right. And that, and that, ha- that the happens. Hurricanes, I wasn't allowed out. I was not allowed to leave CDC. And so what, I, I talked to my team regularly. Um, I was their reach back. I did whatever I could. So I was on the phone late at night. I was training other SAT members because a lot of SATs hadn't been out the door. So you try to find ways to help. Again, it won't be on your CV and no one will notice, but um, you try to help however you can. But that feeling of not being out with your team can be really tough. It was I, uh, yeah. horrible. Yeah. Hard, or not, not being out on your team, not doing what you want. Uh, with Sandy, Hurricane Sandy happened, and Luca, my firstborn, was born in September. And I'm from New Jersey. Went to New Jersey. It was Middlesex County College. I live two minutes from Middlesex County College in Middlesex County in Highland Park, New Jersey. Born and raised. Families in the health department. I can bring the baby. I can nurse. My mom can like bring the baby back and forth every two hours. Aaron, you are going to an FMS. There are going to be people there who are sick. You can't bring a newborn. But what? Because you have a newborn. Yeah. I had the same experience. It's with my daughter when she was born. Already at five, I had never deployed, so I didn't know the impact of deployment would make on my life. Yeah. But I was on maternity leave. I had a month old, and the hurricane hit. And RDF five went down to uh, Puerto Rico. Yeah. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. And I, Florida, I wanted to join so bad. It hurts your heart. It hurt. It hurt. And and had that happened after. I deployed for the first time and knew how much I loved deploying and how I fall in love with, you know, the, the whole process and the officers and everything. I think it would have hurt me even worse to, to know, yeah. to understand fully mm-hmm. what I was missing out on, you know. Uh, but I had the same thing happen. And I literally told my husband, I was like, I want to tell them, like, oh, come on, I'm to leave. Sure, but you can't do that. Come on. I mean, no. our first priority is always going to be our children. And... Um, it's hard though. But it's hard. It's, it's hard. hard. Same experience with Sandy. I was pregnant with my twins, like seven months along. Yeah. And we, yeah, we went out the door. And I, um, it's hard to see the emails because you want to be a part of it. You oh, want to yeah. jump in. You want to mm-hmm. make that difference. You want to be, you know, you don't want. That's part of being it's a woman, so, though. And it, it's yeah. so annoying and yeah. infuriating. By the way, if you guys don't have maternity ODUs, you are missing one of the most singular beautiful experiences about being an officer, which is wearing not only pajamas to work every day. Tents. 
Oh no no no! The ODUs are amazing. They don't—they make you look like you're not pregnant and you're in like just squishy clothes, and they're wonderful. And nobody's gonna mess with you because you still look really tough, even though you're pregnant and waddling. And if you're pregnant, you're tough. You are. That's yeah, that's so true. true. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, no argument there. I'm really happy we've been on this whole discussion of resiliency and transitioning back home and wanting to get out and wanting to be good, but not being in a position to be able to or not being able to go out because I feel like we have a tendency as a whole, as a core to kind of almost sometimes downplay our own deployments and our own impact because we compare ourselves um, to our sister services who go out for much longer and are in a different type of mission and different type of field. Mm -hmm. And so especially for those officers who don't have a family of officers immediately around them to talk to, to talk to them and to talk them through it. I think it's just good that we're, we're bringing it up and we're having the discussion that I have trouble transitioning home mm -hmm. after being gone for quote unquote, just two weeks. And I don't know if you guys have any strategies that you've gone through on like how to deal with your significant others, your kids, your families, your parents, when you transition back, um, your bosses, when you transition back, because I know it's not just transitioning back to your family. It's transitioning back to your job. People are like, oh, well, you were, you were just gone for two weeks and you just, you know, you went down to this hurricane thing. And sometimes... It's like a vacation from your job. Yes. Oh, you got to deploy? Mm -hmm. Why aren't you done doing all of your work? Yeah. Because I was deployed. And, and I think, depending on who your supervisor is. 17 hours a day for 14 or 15 days straight and you're exhausted. It's, mm -hmm. it's exhausting. Yeah, but you Mentally, were away from work. Why would you be tired? I... I'm very yeah. fortunate. I have a really amazing boss. So when nice. I come back from deployments, I've been able to take leave if I wanted to. And I also have an amazing spouse who stays home with our kids. So Nice. I gotta Shout say, out to those guys. Yeah, he's a rock star. Nice. Yeah. I'm a big nice. advocate of taking leave. Um, Two-week deployment, versus, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, but that adjustment that all of a sudden, you know, and for them to get used to you, too. You've been gone. Well, yeah. They've gotten out of the routine yeah. of you doing what you're supposed to do. But you, you get home, and, and you're shifting missions. I mean, we can't forget that you're absolutely right, Jess, but we are mission-driven, yeah. mission-focused. And when we deploy, we, like I said, we're all in. And so when you come home, they, that's a shift. And mm -hmm. when you're at home, I mean, I'm not a mom, but those of you that are, your primary mission is mom, right? I mean, it has to be when you're home, right? That's I mean, what they say. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, no, I they're say that young in jest, enough, They're young yeah. enough that, that yeah. it's, you got to feed them. You got to right. bathe <laughs> them. You got to yeah. do the basics, right? Yeah. Right. And, and then you have your work right. mission, your day-to-day -day mission. And so, you know, stopping on a dime and doing that, that shift, that's, that's tough to do. Um, it's completely doable. But it takes it takes a little time and adjustment. I strongly recommend honesty. That doesn't mean ultimate transparency, right? There are some stories that you do not want to share nope. with your nope. loved ones, with your colleagues. You just don't. And that's okay. That is absolutely okay. That's what your battle buddies are for, right? Mm -hmm. But it's honesty in that, hey boss, I'm I'm kind of having a tough time readjusting. This is what's been going on for me or something. But so my biggest tip, I would say, is is honesty. Sound things out with your battle buddy mm -hmm. or battle buddies, you know, um, if you're worried. Um, but just being honest. I mean, think about if you're a boss, like you have deadlines. You don't necessarily care what's going on. You have deadlines. They need to be met. But if you're honest and upfront with your boss and saying, I need a little more time because, you know, your, your boss is better off and hopefully that relationship is better off. But that's what I would say is just be honest. That's great advice. Cause I've gone out the door several times myself and I have never once been smart enough to put two and two together that I've just been out for just shy of the time that you need to get the one respite day. Yeah. And my brain is already trying to transition back to yeah. work. I'm like, I got to get these done and I have to do these things. It never once dawned on me to be like, I'm going to take two days of annual leave and I'm going to get myself right and I'm going to get myself good and I'm going to come back strong. That's just, I've never thought of that. That's, that's no, genius. I think you need it. I and do it before you go out. Yeah. Oh, request. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. That's yeah. super so no, Do it I before agree. you go out. So your boss's expectations yes. are, Jess isn't going to be back until X date. 
No, I think it's really important. I, I communicate with my supervisor while I'm deployed, as long as I have service and yeah. I can do that um, through mm -hmm. my phone. But um, I just let him know. I need to catch up on sleep. It's exhausting. You you don't sleep well. Even no. if you yeah. get a chance to sleep, you know, seven or eight hours, you don't sleep well because you're always thinking about the the next day and the, what you have to do. and Getting in the know, shower Did you brief first. the night shift or the day shift um, with everything that you needed to? And, yeah, did you get a shower? Can you get a shower? Who's You know, it's just there's so much, and you don't sleep well, and you work 15, 13, 17 hours a day depending on the day and without days off, and it's tiring. You need the, you need the days off. Yeah. It's important. Yeah, it's, it's so important. It's so important. So I feel like I could talk to you ladies for like a whole other hour. Well, I think we will. I, right. Oh, well, yeah, okay. offline. But I know it's the symposium and there's stuff going on, and I know you all have a ton of other stuff to do. So just thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your honesty, your openness. Thank you for sharing your hearts, your stories with us. Um, so before I let you guys go today, uh, I just want to ask you if you have one little last snippet, tidbit, um, mental preparedness, something you should pack, something you should tell your family, your bosses, your loved one, just one little, I'm going to call it a clinical pearl, uh, <laughs> before we go. So I'll go ahead and start with you, Erin. For myself, the best thing, even if you're not going to be in an area where there's malaria or yellow fever, get yourself a SANS bug pop-up bug tent and a sheet, and it, you, it turns into a cocoon. So it pops up, you zipper yourself in, and you can put um, a queen-size sheet on top of it, and you're, you're in your little cocoon. Nobody's around you. You're peaceful. I also bring coloring books and sharp uh, markers so I can color like these little intricate ones. Mm -hmm. I have to do that in the middle of the night. And one of the great tips that I got from Monrovia was to make, before you go, make a jar for each of your kids or your whomever you live with, if you live with anybody, um, and you put one Hershey's Kiss in the jar for each night that you're, you're expecting to be away so they Aww. get to eat one. Say, Mommy's not here to give you kisses. It hugs, but here you can have one, which is wonderful for three year olds. Sweet. So they get to eat it. But then they also be able, they can see, like, okay, mommy's going to be coming home in three more Hershey's Kisses. That's so, really cute. Yeah, it's kind of awesome. The cocoon, coloring, and chocolate. I have to agree with your bug tent, because I had one on one deployment, and just as a little funny thing, they started calling it my princess tent. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah, and then they would decorate it, but... Um, That's really nice of them. I don't, yes, yeah, I don't I care if they're so I have a princess tent. Um, but I think for me, um, well, there's so many things. I can't even think of anything specific. But noise canceling headphones or earbuds are important because you can download a, like a sound app and people snore. And if you've ever slept in a tent with like 30 other people, multiple people snore. <laughs> so sorry. That's one thing <laughs> that's on my list. <laughs> oh. oh, so I've never deployed to somewhere that I would need a bug tent. Um, but I'm a total girly girl. Uh, so this may not apply to every female in the Commission Corps, but for me, I need waterproof mascara. <laughs> <laughs> Hands down. Yes. I cannot Especially leave. Especially when you're in an ocean. Yes. I, I know. I know. So, so you know. I swear to God, I'm not shallow. <laughs> no, I brought I brought toenail polish to Liberia. Yeah, but I need Most waterproof colors. mascara uh, because you know I just can't live without it. So there, I like it. Uh, I mean, <laughs> no shame. I like it. It's no good shame. <laughs> um, take leave uh, before you yes. head out the door, um, and find your people. Um, they don't need to be, you know, your best. I mean, I've just met three of the people in this room, one I haven't known very well, and we already have developed, I would say, some bit of a sisterhood. Yeah. And and be open to that. So I'm not saying something you can pack in your bag, but something you can bring with you is an openness um, to meeting others and um, being open to them, and they'll open, to, open up to you. And I'd say... Um, I'd say developing that and bringing that with you and the ability to do anything and everything. I like Take that. out the trash. I like it. Do whatever is needed. Um, be prepared for that. And uh, you will be a great deployer. There is no job beneath us. That's yeah. true. Hell no. There's no job beneath us. Yeah, Party of three really pushed that. Oh, Our really? environmental health people, our food safety yeah. people, oh, well, shout good. out to food safety <laughs> that, <laughs> on RDF3. Yeah. What, what? 
Yes, yeah. they're amazing. Yeah. Everything yeah. from well, I, I mean, we're saying I'm an environmental health officer. Yeah. We don't want to be thought of as the trash people, but if you need the trash taken out, we're your people. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> gonna do it. Somebody's yeah. gotta take out the trash, yeah. especially if it's radioactive, because yeah. if you know. I mean, yeah, that's important. Radio pharmaceuticals and things like that, you know. I mean. I'm going to give my own tidbit of what to take real quick. Uh, I would say take your favorite shareable candy. Cause I have gotten extra paper. I have gotten people to give people rides places with Reese's cups. I'm not, I'm not joking. So your favorite yeah. shareable candy uh, is my Keep suggestion. Are awesome. But thank you ladies again for coming. Thank this you. has been thank my you. pleasure yeah. to talk yeah. with you guys. Yeah. I really Very appreciate enjoyable. it so much. Thanks for having yeah. us. Thanks. We want to come back. I'm so I, happy to have met I all think of you. I think we might be able to do yeah. that. Yeah. And, and then um, I just want to thank everybody real quick for listening. Mm -hmm. um, please check out our YouTube channel, the Women's Leadership Support Group, USPHS. And if you have any suggestions or topics or guests you'd like to hear from, please contact us at forumforfemaleofficers at gmail.com. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.